Hello and welcome to episode 243 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm good. It's, um, yeah, been a busy week. We've had a lot going on and uh, I want to start the podcast actually, before I forget, mentioning the meetup we're doing. I can't remember if we mentioned it last week, we didn't. but... I know there's a lot of you who listen to this show and Pete Matthews' show, Meaningful Money podcast. Well, Pete and I, well, the team here, are doing a podcast meetup on Friday the 8th of November. So the location is the same place we did it last year. We'll put information out on social media channels. In our uh, Facebook group, we'll put it out there, but it was in the Cross Keys pub, wasn't it, Andy? Yep, that's it. In the um, centre of the city of London, so it's just down from Liverpool Street. We'll put out details uh, nearer the time, but put it in your diary. It's just a us going to the pub, drinking whatever you want to drink, beer, Andy, <laughs> soda and lime, yeah. and we are just going to, it's just to, to mingle, chat to all the listeners on both podcasts and for them to talk to each other. Last year we did it. It was brilliant fun. So put it in your diary. We're doing the meetup again. I think this is seemingly going to be almost an annual event because Pete comes from all the way from Penzance every year. Not to meet me. It's actually to do a, uh, I think go to a conference and then we kind of bundle this together because obviously we're, we're friends and we want to meet up. So put it in your diary. That's the first thing. I also want to thank people who have reviewed the podcast. There's a few of you who have reviewed the podcast. We need more reviews on iTunes, please. So if you've not reviewed the podcast, go on there and do it because next time we will probably read out some of those uh, reviews as well. So that would be wonderful. And um, I just suppose the other thing to touch upon is the Facebook group is going from strength to strength. If you've not joined the Facebook group yet, go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses and we've had loads of topics this week again about different things drawdown favorite rules of thumb Uh, we had somebody share the uh, mother of all spreadsheets about budgeting so there's some great conversation going on in there and as we've said on the previous podcast it's always positive so we are really trying to encourage people to join that community it's really good so go there join that group and um, you'll see me in there from time to time answering questions as well. So I've just posted one, funnily enough, about budgeting apps. Yeah, we've got over 600 members in that group now, and it's literally growing day by day. And as you mentioned one there. I suppose we should name check him. It's Christian Hall who did the uh, the mother of all spreadsheets. And he actually posted an update just the other day to say that he's constantly updating and reviewing it. So he's getting feedback from our listeners and what they want to see in it. And he's providing sort of solutions. Yeah. Great. And, and he also won a mug. So it was <laughs> yeah. deemed mug worthy. So don't forget, you can get yourself a mug. If you do anything that's mug worthy, particularly in the group, then we will send you a mug and you can appear on the mug wall of fame, which I am looking at as we speak, we've had some new members. So, um, yeah, all exciting. The other thing is we've got the new website coming soon, which I shared a sneak peek of it from my position on a train as Justin was looking at it uh, I look over his shoulder. If you want to see it on Instagram, go and have a look at our stories. It might have disappeared by the time this podcast comes out, but nevertheless. Before I get on to what's on this week's show, one thing from last week, we had somebody called Andy write in. Every, there's lots of Andys that listen to this podcast. It's yep. a popular name. It is a good name. <laughs> um, touching upon the question we raised or the topic we raised about the stamp duty tax trap for the poor lady last week. Uh, one good point he made was that if the lady had actually moved out into a, a rental property, another rental that's not hers, then she wouldn't have had the um, the issue. So um, something to bear in mind there. So that's more of a sort of in hindsight kind of thing, a tip for other people who might, it, it won't help her out per se, but it, for others no, the it, it's, it, the implication was there from what we yeah. were talking about, but it was actually worth highlighting that point that she obviously didn't have to be homeless but she could have um, gone Escape, and rented. Yeah. yeah, so there we go. On with this sh- this week's show. Yeah, so what have we got coming up? Uh, Woodford. We could not have Woodford on this show. Uh, we've not actually got him, actually. He's probably <laughs> hiding somewhere. <laughs> that, that would be a coup, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got to talk about Woodford because there's been a... Uh, well, he's, his empire has completely imploded. 
and his reputation is in tatters. We've got to talk about the impact on investors that are in that fund and what's actually happened and the whole fallout of that. So that's going to be a key part of the show. I'm also going to talk about 40 year mortgages. It's something that's kind of crept up on the, on the market to a certain extent. Well, actually there's been quite a few of them. That's one of the points I'm going to make in that piece. So it's about 40 year mortgages and one or two pros and cons things to bear in mind because they're becoming quite a popular product. And finally, a, a, a quick piece on ISAs at death. So it's uh, what happens to ISAs when you die. It's slightly different to other investments, so your ISA allowance. So it's something worth listening to there. Should we get stuck into the meaty bit and uh, let's talk about Woodford? We'll get stuck into Woodford. I think there's plenty <laughs> of people out there who would quite like to get stuck into Woodford. But yes, what what's happened? So if you remember, we did a, a show, episode 225, which was all about the Neil Woodford saga as it started to unravel. So when in June, if you remember, he had his equity income fund that sort of bears his name closed to new money and actually trapped investors in there. So there's billions of pounds worth of money stuck in there because the withdrawals from that fund were accelerating and they were, they were unsustainable basically because Neil Woodford had invested in these illiquid smaller companies. Now, I'm not going to go into the sort of whys and wherefores of that because I listened back to episode 225. And you nailed it. And, and, and I said to Andy before this show, I listened to it. I said, God, that was a good show. And so it had a, a lot of insight. The whole show was dedicated to it. It's worth going back and listening to it because there's a lot of other insights that I give around fund management, about how the press interact with fund management, how you should take a lot of what's in the press with a pinch of salt, all those sorts of things. It wasn't just about Woodford himself. It was about the wider uh, issues with fund management and the way it is portrayed in the press and the way we interact with it through fund platforms. So anyway, on to what's happened this week. Neil Woodford has basically closed down his empire. So his Woodford fund management firm has closed down because the fund, if you remember, he had an equity income fund. It was a unit trust and it was where the epicenter of the problems were because he had these illiquid investments, couldn't cope with the withdrawals. It was a slow motion car crash, as I explained previously. You could see this really come in before it actually happened. And the only one who uh, potentially didn't and who was uh, belligerently sort of beavering on was, was Woodford well, himself. He believed it was all going to be fine. He was going to work it out in the end. And I don't like the idea that people who invested in the fund are made to feel that they should have got out because at the end of the day, they, they, there was a lot of positive pressure on uh, to be in it. I mean, lots of platforms were still promoting it right up to the day it was closed. And the press was still producing stories saying about how wonderful Woodford was uh, right up until it um, closed. Funny enough, this week, like I said, it's all imploded, which I'll explain in a second. But Sky News actually put out a piece. If you look at my Twitter feed, I showed a picture of this headline, which was sort of incredible, basically still saying he was a star manager or top stock picker and that he's empire had collapsed you're sitting there looking at it it that isn't possible i mean by definition he's not a top stock picker so it's still got that where we want to put star managers he's got a obviously a very good pr team but people who get caught up in it that's unfortunate and i don't think people should be made to feel silly or anything like that because they weren't privy to all the information that obviously woodford had but the information didn't necessarily filter out and it should have done through the fund platforms that were promoting them but anyway what happened is a link who are the administrators of the unit trust. So uh, Woodford was the manager, his company ran the fund, and they basically decided that we're going to wind up this fund. So if you remember, the fund was closed in June, and it was meant to be closed for a short period of time, and then reopened after maybe 28 days, and that kept being pushed back. And then they said it wouldn't be open until the end of the year, at the earliest. And so Link have basically said, no, it's not going to happen, actually, because although Woodford was trying to restructure the fund by getting rid of some of these e-liquid assets and trying to buy more liquid assets and alter the portfolio, they said that this isn't going to work because when they open the fund, people are going to just try and withdraw their money. And they would rather get to the point where investors were going to get something back. So they basically said, we're winding it up. Neil Woodford himself arrogantly said this is a bad idea and he, it's not in the best interest of the unit trust holders, which, like I say, is, is quite incredible given how far we've fallen. Let's be honest, since its height, that fund lost 40% of people's money. Yeah. And you've got to think that since the fund closed in June, so this when I say closed, I mean that the fact that the money was frozen in there, 
it's fallen about another 20%. And you've got to think that that money was just falling in value. And that was partly because the vultures were circling. They could see what he held in his fund. And he was starting to become a forced seller of assets and stocks in these companies. And if in doing so, people sitting around the outside know they can basically buy it at a cheap price and they can drive down the value of them. I liken that to a football team who's got a one-to-way striker. Once you know that's a one-to-way striker, his value diminishes and the, and the club starts circling. It's that kind of thing. It's it? exactly that. And we've got to the point where, well, he, Neil Woodford got to the point where he was fighting an uphill battle. It was never going to happen. So they, they closed the fund. They said, we're winding it up. Neil Woodford, therefore, whatever way you want to look at it, threw his toys out the pram or made a, a, a decision. Because the, the one problem you had is there was a, another fund, a unit trust, which was an income focus fund that hadn't closed. And there was an investment trust that bared his name. So th- that was the Woodford Patient Capital Trust. And of course, that is a investment trust has a slightly different structure. So it doesn't have the same issues when it comes to people withdrawing money because there's a fixed number of shares that exist in that fund and people buy shares and sell them within that investment trust so go back and listen to episode 225 for the full explanation as to why what happened woodford then said right that's it i'm off and he's closed down his fund management company and he served notice on those funds so this is what's slightly odd actually because he's got a notice period on the income focus fund now because he's now closed the income focus fund so like i said the one fund that was already closed uh, you can get your money out the other income focus one hadn't that's been tumbling in value that is now frozen so people who still got their money in that it's been frozen the investment trust isn't frozen because it's an investment trust but now they don't have a manager they've served no he served notice so what's happened oddly the notice periods on the two are slightly different so on the uh, income focus fund it's a a six month period and on the investment trust i think it's a a three month notice period that he's got but either way investors are stuck in his unit trust funds still and in the investment trust, there's no manager and they're trying to sort that out. The board are trying to sort that out. So what is the impact for Woodford, first of all? Well, his career is in tatters. His name, his sort of reputation is in, in tatters. But there was an amazing infographic that this is money produced. So that's basically the Daily Mail. And they, they obviously are sticking the boot in on Woodford and they, they created some figures. Then, well, not created. They found out some figures. He's withdrawn 63 million pounds in dividends and profits that over the last four years and 37 million pound has been extracted by his uh, business partner, Craig Newman. And all the time the equity income fund was frozen, they were generating a hundred grand a day in fees which is an incredible amount of money. If you want to go and find the infographic, you can. It talks about his properties, Woodford's properties that he owns that are basically worth about £20 million. Pounds, the, what cars he owns, the 18 event horses that he owns. And obviously then compares that to the fact that the, the investors have lost out so much. So they've got issues now because they obviously can't get the money out of the two unit trusts. The investment trust they could technically sell but they've already gone. The investment trust fell to a 50% discount. So you're at a point now where the discount on it, so that's saying the share price versus what the assets are probably worth is falling another 50%. So interestingly on that one, I think there's never ever been any fees charged on it because the performance has been so dire. It, so that just goes to show. That, Andy's exactly right. That's, that's the point. So where we are with the two funds, you can't get your money out. The, I suppose positive news for people who are stuck in the equity income fund is that now, as a result of the administrator saying they're going to wind up the fund, what happens is a three month notice period now where uh, after three months, they can actually start beginning the wind up process. So that takes it to the 17th of January. So at that point, they can start liquidating the fund. And the plan is that investors in that unit trust are going to start getting their money back in installments over time. Now, you don't know how much you're going to get back because it all very much depends on how much they can actually get for the assets that Neil Woodford still holds and he still holds some of those illiquid assets. So you're going to start getting your money back, but you don't know how much. And unfortunately, that means there are going to be a lot of people who have lost money and they will probably sit on losses and those losses will be crystallized because they were never had, they were never able to recover from it. Woodford wasn't able to right the wrong that he'd, um, he created. There are going to be more problems potentially to come from this because if you think about it, Woodford owned 
large stakes in small companies. So to give you two examples, Eddie Stobart, if you remember the Eddie mm-hmm. Stobart uh, firms, those my great ch- green lorries. My that- children still play the game where they look at, they look at the, the names on the front. Did you know that lorries have all got names? I, do you know what, Andy? I, I think that's 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 News. slipped from my memory, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, no, but they've all got girls' names. And, oh, uh, so, yeah, the ad girls tick them off when they go on long journeys. Well, the reason I say it slipped from my memory, I always remember when I was younger, you used to look for the Eddie Stobart lorries. And, mm. I th- and perhaps that was the game. I thought it was just to see them. But yeah, they've all got female names. Yeah, they've all got female names. And they've, they they at one point, they had so many in their fleet that the names were ridiculous. They were double-barreled, treble-barreled, names that you've never heard before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so you do that when you're not train spotting. Yeah, you exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. So Eddie Stobart is one of them. He owned 22.9% of the shares in that company. So there is going to be basically a fire sale of the stuff that's in the Woodford Income Fund. So what it means is that that share price of those stocks are going to be under pressure. Purple Bricks is another good example. He was an investor in Purple Bricks, the online estate agency. So there is going to be a material impact on the share price of these companies and perhaps the people who own those shares outside of Woodford. Now, Link, who are the administrators, aren't going to be taking any fees for winding up this fund, apparently. But what it does mean is there are going to be probably increased costs in doing so because you're going to try and sell these things down. So they're not going to be able to necessarily control that. So where we are... That investors in this his empire in his unit trust are going to start getting their their money back. The other thing is that Hargreaves Lansdowne obviously came under a lot of pressure and criticism because of the fact that they won the last platforms to still be promoting it. Their share price fell about four percent on the news, which is interesting. But also their multi manager fund range holds Woodford across the range, so that was another issue. But if you hold those Hargreaves Lansdowne funds, those multi-manager funds, you can still sell those. So if you, for some reason, decide you don't want to be in those funds because they've got exposure to this uh, Woodford problem, you can still sell out those and so you can leave. So the impact on those people, those multi-manager funds, it might obviously impact the performance, but you can now get out of it. Going forward, what does this mean? Then it's probably going to be a investigation into really what went on. And so they're going to be probably the companies involved, Link being one of them, the administrators, obviously Woodford in his company itself, perhaps the other promoters of the fund. And there's hopefully going to be an FCA investigation into it. I know MPs are starting to ask questions and they're probably going to have to be representations in front of them. But going forward, there's definitely going to have to be some sort of shift in this combination of illiquid assets and unit trust, which is where the, the problems occurred. Now, one interesting thing, one positive I want to sort of put out there for the people who are in that fund, because there are people who have got money in it. You want to look at something called GAM. Now, GAM investments last year, so this is 2019, I'm making this podcast. We're going back to 2018. There was a fund manager there called Tim Hayward, and he was suspended in July of 2018. And it was basically because he'd breached certain rules of within that the fund manager had uh, put in place. And I'm not privy to what exactly what they were, but they obviously were quite serious breaches. I think he's still trying to appeal the situation. But he was sacked. And in doing so, they decided they were going to actually wind up his absolute return bond fund that he had. And it was £7 billion worth of assets in there. And so the reason I mention this, because there's obviously similar parallels. We've got a situation where a fund is being wound up. Now, they did that over installments, uh, trying to sell the stuff down. And they just got to the point where they finally sold the last bit of money so they could turn it to investors. And when I was checking the other day, I actually think they managed to get it where it was almost at par or slightly in profit from the point where they thought they were going to be. So people got the money back from the value of the fund. Now, this is a very, obviously, it's kind of apples and pears in some way because this is one type of fund that invested in one type of asset. So it was an absolute return bond fund. Neil Woodford's is an equity fund and it invested in illiquid assets um, or less liquid assets. So I just wanted to put it out there because there has been precedent for this and people have got some of them, well, most of their money back. So I just want to give a sort of like a, a, a slight bit of hope for people in the fund. I'm not sure necessarily that's going to be the case with Woodford. But the lessons to learn, there were some in episode 225 of the podcast that I mentioned. But again, this illiquid unit trust idea. So property funds that are another one. So ones invest in bricks and mortar. Unit trust is another issue. We've had that with Brexit. Don't follow fund managers. This is a great example. We're getting in danger of following others. There's Terry Smith who's out there 
He's a very popular and successful fund manager, but I worry that he's getting put on a bit of a pedestal like Woodford has been because for whatever reason, we do seem to like pressing, they seem to like to create these almost gods in fund management world where every dog has its day, the reality is. And so they will underperform over time. Do try and look at funds top holdings if you can when you have a fund to try and avoid such situations. Look at the performance over time. Look at the style of the fund. Now, Lots of people have been talking about, oh, there was a style drift with Woodford from the point where he launched it to where he ended up. And I don't know if that's the right word for it, a drift. I think it was actually a conscious decision. The drift suggests to me it sort of moved away, kind of things drifted. No, he decided to go down that road and invest in it. It was a conscious decision. So it's not always clear what managers are doing, but you should try and review them and look at the performance of them. Don't trust the press when it comes to promoting funds and what you read. Always look at something and wonder why it's been uh, written about. I'll give you an example. Today I saw something about fund charges and the impact of compounding, etc. And when you look at it, it's, it's based on research from Vanguard. Now, it's completely true, it's right, but they do a whole piece about that in the um, This Is Money, but it's really driven by what Vanguard want to get out there and put out there as a message, which whether it's true or not, I mean, in this case, it does have an impact, obviously, but you have to realise what's the motivation for any piece you see out there, and there are pieces that are still done for the benefit of fund managers. Platform Best Buy lists and IFAs and uh, rating agencies, their recommendations need to be kind of looked at because once they, once you chose a Best Buy from their fund list, they're getting paid on it. There's a slight question over the ethics of that in some way, but particularly where the people who choose the funds could actually be on the multi-manager fund panels for, for platforms themselves as well. Because in this instance, don't forget, if if a platform pulled out on, on, on mass from Woodford, then they could have closed the fund itself, etc. So they could actually cause problems. They can drive a fund up in terms of assets, but they could also kill it. And that is a, a slight issue. Rating agencies, they basically downgraded the fund after the horse had bolted. And the sort of financial advisors, it's more about how, what is their process for choosing investments? Is it just picking people they like going and having a drink with? Who, or is it just they're picking popular names? They should have something that's robust. If they do, perfect. Diversify as ever. And of course, if you want to look at something alternatives to do with income, then we have stuff on 8020 Investor with the income heat maps. And Investment Trust is the latest one that we've done. So Andy, I think that's it. I think I've covered everything on that one on Woodford. But like I say, go back and listen to episode 225 to get the full rounded picture. At the start of 2019, we launched Damien's Money MOT, which is the culmination of about 10 years worth of work on Money to the Masses. It's a tool that will give people an assessment of where they are with their finances in just two minutes without any registration or paperwork required. My Money MOT will tell you how you measure up against thousands of other people who have already taken the MOT themselves. By answering just a few simple questions, you receive a grade from A to E. And it doesn't matter whether you're a student or a multi-millionaire, the grade is relevant to you as a person and your stage in life. Crucially, you can sign up to receive your own free action plan that's personalized to you and delivered via email. The Money MOT covers everything from wills to cash to bills, all the way through to retirement planning. Within the first five months after launch, more than 10,000 people have done Damien's Money MOT for free. And after 10 years of work, I have to say it's something I'm extremely proud of. Okay, 40 year mortgages, they're becoming more popular. We're going to go through some pros and cons. Yeah, it, it, this came about because Money Facts, who are the people, they, they, they publish data about the products out there and sort of best mortgage rates and things like that. And I saw some research that they'd produced which showed that 57% of the mortgages out there have a maximum term now of 40 years. So you could take out those products over 40 years, which is, um, up massively that i mean i hadn't quite appreciated that even five years ago f- only 40 percent of the products allowed you to have a term that long but interestingly i didn't quite appreciate it that that many could allow you to have a 40-year mortgage because we're only really getting a lot of press about it now about the 40-year mortgage so at the same time a lot of companies as well as increasing that so you can have a 40-year term they're increasing the maximum age at which somebody can have a mortgage up to age 80 so so you and i can't get a 40-year mortgage <laughs> Just. Yes, yes, Andy. You just you just pointed out something there which I hadn't realised. But yes, so the forty year mortgage is not for me. Um but but for some people it's becoming a more popular choice. 
And the this is the pros of it. So this is why. The 40-year mortgage, what it can do is if you increase the term of your mortgage, you can reduce the pounds and pence you pay a month. Because what you're doing is you're putting the, the repayment period much longer so you can knock down the um, the cost per month. And some people are using it to help them meet affordability checks that are there now. So they can actually afford the mortgage because it reduces the monthly payment. So that's obviously the pros of a um, 40-year mortgage. But the, the con of it, and I'm going to give you an example in a second. One of the biggest ones is you end up paying more interest over the longer term. So this is the example. If you think of a £250,000 mortgage with a 2.5% interest rate. Now, if you just did a normal, traditional, I'd like to say, 25-year term, then the amount you'd pay a month would be £1,121. So the total interest you'd pay over that 25-year period is 86463 If instead you decided to take it over a 40-year term, then that would make the monthly repayments you make £824 a month. So you can see that's a big difference. That's about £300 difference there on the monthly repayments. But the total interest that you pay over the 40 years is £145,000, £145,733 to be exact, which if you take the difference... That's £52,970. So 53000 just to make it easy for people to remember. And that's obviously a huge amount of money of interest, additional interest you're going to be paying by taking it over the longer term. So people just need to bear in mind that. But it's interesting because the interest rate for all intents and purposes is the same. It's 2.5%. But that extra term means that you're paying it over so much longer. And so, you, you know, it, some people don't work in, in that way. And yeah, but it's, but it's, it's clear. But it's worth doing the numbers. And so, what it also means, one of the other um, cons on it, is that you're probably going to end up, if you use one of these, having a mortgage beyond your pension age. So, the reality is that people may think, oh, that's not even tomorrow's problem. That's the retired version of me's problem. But at some point, you do need to have a plan of how you're going to pay that. Because just taking a slightly, often a slight, tangible almost parallel with the people with the interest only issue now so people have interest only mortgages who didn't actually build up a way of like a repayment vehicle some investment or cash to repay their mortgage when they got to the point that they retired and the mortgage was due they've got this huge bill they basically got to pay and to repay they're being forced to have to maybe downsize or something like that the other thing to bear in mind is that obviously if you go i want a 40-year mortgage that's me i'm going for that it reduces the number of borrowers you can actually borrow from, which therefore limits your ability to get a mortgage as well. Because if you're reducing the number of borrowers, then your options are smaller. And like I said, 57% of the products on the market, so we're almost at 50-50, are 40-year. That means half of them won't allow a 40-year term. Of course, the one thing is you could choose to be on a 40-year mortgage. And the one way around this issue of limiting your options is if you decide to start to overpay so if you decided to overpay on your mortgage, then when you came to the point of you wanting to remortgage, you'd have far more options because therefore you'd be able to take a shorter term rather than having a longer term mortgage if you started to overpay it. So if you're on one and you're thinking, yeah, do you know what? I might want to change. Then if you overpay, you're more likely to have more options when you come to the point of remortgaging. Okay, so the final part of this week's podcast, we're going to be talking about ISAs and more specifically, what happens to your ISA if you die? Yeah. That's it. So ISAs, since April 2018, the rules have changed that allow a spouse or a civil partner to inherit an ISA allowance. So it's called an additional permitted subscription, APS. It sounds like something that should be on your car, yeah. but it basically means that you can inherit an allowance. Now, the value of that is determined. It can either be the date as a death or when it's utilised, So, or sorry, when it's closed. So if you think about it, the way it works is that you have three years, so the estate could be administered, but you've got three years of potential tax-free growth that's going to happen, and it's called a continuing ISA. So during that period, the ISA is still growing tax-free. Previously, it didn't, you see. So previously, it was it was capped at the point of death, and any additional growth during that period would be potentially taxable. Right. So now you have this continuing ISA allowance. So this continuing ISA, and then what happens is that the spouse 
or civil partner can inherit that allowance. Interestingly, they don't have to actually inherit the funds. So what can happen is you get to a point where the money in the ISA could be inherited by somebody else, but the actual allowance can be inherited, can it, can right. be inherited by the spouse and they fund it themselves through could be through money they've inherited because i suppose what the government are thinking is as a, as a partnership just because someone's died they shouldn't necessarily lose the, lose those benefits of that tax wrapper yeah exactly they shouldn't die with them exactly that yeah. so they wanted the idea that this allowance could be passed on as this, under this APS and the spouse or civil partner can benefit from it so they have 3 years to claim it if you don't claim it in time then it can be an extension of 180 days so the message of this part of the podcast is that you can inherit an ISA allowance if you are married or in a civil partnership okay so that's it for this week's podcast uh, if you want to contact Damien you can do so it's Damien at money to the masses.com you can also get in touch on Twitter it's at money to the masses with number two Instagram as well Make sure you review the podcast, get onto iTunes and pop us a little review. We'll be reading those out soon. So do get your review on there if you want to hear your review read out. Don't forget the Money to the Masses community on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Money to the Masses. Get over there, say hello. Lots of stuff happening this week. And make sure you ask questions. And don't forget, as I mentioned at the very start of the podcast, we're doing a meet up in a pub. Yep. On the 8th of November, on a Friday. And for those who like their technology... It's a Weatherspoons pub and they've got an app. So <laughs> you can come to the pub and you don't even have to go to the bar. So you can order your drinks on the app and it will deliver them to your table. So if you if you like technology but don't like beer <laughs> or queuing <laughs> or decent beer, it's a Weatherspoons. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we've got just right before we go, we've got a slight announcement about next week, haven't we? Yes, yeah, so we may not have a podcast next week. Midweek markets will be as usual. So we'll have a midweek market show. But Andy and I... Uh, spending a bit of time with our respective families as it is half term. So we've, we've just worked out that we're, we're not going to see each other for a week, no. despite <laughs> being work colleagues these days. So there may not be a podcast. We might try and uh, engineer something. So keep a view, uh, an eye on your feeds, but it may not be a podcast next week. Anyway, until next time. Until next time. <laughs>